Welcome everyone to our scripture reflection for the second Sunday of Ordinary Time. I invite you to listen to a proclamation of the gospel according to John. John the Baptist was standing with two of his disciples, and as he watched Jesus walk by, he said, Behold, the Lamb of God. The disciples heard what John said and followed Jesus. Jesus turned and saw them following him and said to them, What are you looking for? And they said to him, Rabbi, which translated means teacher, where are you staying? He said, Come and you will see. So they went to see where he was staying and stayed with him that day. It was about four in the afternoon. Andrew, the brother of Simon Peter, was one of two of John's disciples who heard what he said. He first went and found his brother Simon Peter and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which is translated Christ. Then he brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, son of John. You will be called Cephas, which is translated Peter. The Gospel of the Lord. More often than not, maybe always, in order for us to see and hear the signs of God's presence in our life, other people have to be involved. We have examples of that in today's gospel, for example. The disciples who were with John did not recognize the Christ when he passed by them. And so it was necessary for John to be involved to point out who he was. Likewise, uh, as soon as Andrew discovered who this was, he went and called his brother Simon. So in order to see the Christ that was present in their midst, other people were necessary for them. Although we didn't hear it today, the first reading this weekend has a similar kind of story involving the sense of hearing. It's a story of Samuel, a young man, and he is sleeping and he hears a voice calling, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel thinks it's his elder, Eli, who's calling him. And he gets up out of bed and goes and says, Here I am, you called me. And Eli says, That wasn't me. Go back to bed. It happens one more time. Same thing. And then a third time. And after the third time, Eli realizes that it is the Lord who is talking to Samuel. And he says to him, It's the Lord who is speaking to you. So if this happens again, Say, speak, Lord, your servant is listening. So in both the first reading today and in the gospel story, we have indications that if we're to recognize the signs of God's presence among us, if we're to see and hear those signs, we need other people in our lives. But that's not all that's necessary. What also is required is once those signs are perceived, then it's necessary to engage them, to see what it is they're calling us to. So Jesus says to the disciples, come and you will see. So they come and they do see. And when that voice comes again to Samuel as he's sleeping, he does in fact say, speak, Lord, your servant is listening. Seems pretty basic, but it's pretty important also to recognize once again that to perceive the signs of God's presence in our lives, we, must, we need other people in our lives who help us to see them and then we have to follow them and respond to them. I'm going to give you two examples. One comes from my own personal life, the other from a, a community life. So the first example is this. Very often, over the course of the years, people have asked me, when did you know you were to be a priest? And that's a hard question to answer. I remember... Uh, when I was a child, at least my siblings tell me that we did this, we played mass. And we'd take an old piece of uh, Millbrook bread and we would smash it down and then we'd take a cup and create a host. And, uh, but what my siblings tell me is that every time we did this, I was the priest. So maybe, maybe from a very young age, I thought I wanted to be a priest. If so, that was something I forgot. 
and over the years I became involved in many, many other things and the thought of priesthood faded from memory, even though I was very actively involved in uh, prayer with my family at, on Sundays and youth group in the parish and uh, retreat programs, uh, perhaps because uh, I was in a dating relationship with a young woman or perhaps I was just uncertain about my future, uh, priesthood wasn't something that was front and center in my consciousness. And when it came time to decide where I wanted to go to college, uh, eventually I settled on John Carroll, uh, probably because there was still some uncertainty in my future. And after I made that decision, I was surprised to learn that one of my classmates from my home parish and at St. Ignatius, who was involved in all the same things I was in my home parish and youth groups and retreats, he had decided that he was going to go to Borromeo Seminary. And I remember being stopped in my tracks. The memory, the distant memory of perhaps priesthood began to gnaw at me. And uh, at first I let it go. And then I began to think if this classmate of mine could respond to what he thought was a call to priesthood, perhaps I ought to give that some consideration. And so over the next several months, that continued to gnaw at me until finally I decided that I was going to move the next year from John Carroll into the seminary so that, in effect, I could come and see. This classmate enrolling into Borromeo Seminary was a sign for me that helped to clarify the call that was incipient in my own vocation. It challenged me, and in some ways it channeled the grace of God to move me in that direction. So another person in my life helped me to perceive the sign that God was present in a specific way, summoned me to come and see, and that's how that began. Another example has to do with uh, a community experience. This was in my previous assignment at Ascension Church, and at Ascension there was a, uh, a women's group called the Women's Guild. And the characteristics of the Women's Guild were these. There were maybe 25 or 30 women. Uh, most of them were well over 65 years of age. Uh, they were, uh, many of them widows, many for decades. Uh, they were strong-willed. I described them as some of the nicest women you'd never want to mess with. And they were exceedingly predictable. So, for example, the Women's Guild would have a calendar of events every year. Their committee would meet to plan that calendar of events, and wouldn't you know it that every year that calendar of events looked almost identical. And when you went to the individual events and saw what they were doing at those events, each of those individual events looked pretty much the same from year to year. Well, every other year or so, the women from this group would come to me and say, Father, how can we get younger women in our group? Uh, we keep trying, but we don't get any younger women. And I just smiled and said, well, you probably have to change what you're doing. I said, because what you're doing is fine for all of you who are participating, but uh, younger women aren't going to be attracted to that. And if you just keep on doing what you're doing, what's going to happen is this group is going to die. And they would say, well, thank you. And then they would leave and go and continue to do what they were doing. Well, it so happened over the course of several years that the women from this group also responded to staff-driven initiatives to participate in our relationship with St. Paul African Methodist Episcopal Church, which I've talked about before. So, for example, many of them participated in our joint retreats, our Good Friday services, our, they were present when their pastor, Gina Thornton, preached at our Ash Wednesday service, at our parish picnics, and they just kind of did this, I think, because of staff-driven initiative. So again, I was quite surprised when one day, early in the day, the day of a Women's Guild meeting, one of the women said to me, Father, are you coming to our meeting tonight? And I said, no, I don't normally come. I had planned on it. Why? And she said, well, we've invited the Women's Guild from St. Paul AME Church to come to our meeting. And here again, I was stopped in my tracks 
because up to this point, all the initiatives that brought the two churches together were staff driven. But what this request to me and to the women from St. Paul AME Guild indicated to me was that something had happened. These women had seen and heard something of the presence of God in our joint interactions. And they decided that they wanted to see what this means. They were coming to see what these interactions and what they were hearing and seeing in these interactions with St. Paul AME meant. And I dare say it might have been just the thing they needed for a little shot of life that they were looking for to expand and grow their organization. So here again, people become conduits of the presence and sign, uh, the signs and presence of God in their lives. And when people respond to those things, then they see a direction that begins to emerge for them amidst their uncertainties. These are just two examples of how that dynamic works. As I was preparing to share these reflections with you, I spent a couple of hours looking back over my life to try to identify moments like these, times when someone in a particular place and time made me attentive to the fact that maybe God was saying something to me, and when I responded, something happened. And in that couple of hours, I was able to identify probably 12 to 15 such in incidents. And I'm sure if I spent more time, I could identify more. But what's interesting about this is as, we, as I engage in this kind of reflection, if I were to put those events on a timeline, I begin to get a sense of what we might call my own salvation history. How has God been at work in my life? How has God been leading me in directions that at the moment I didn't quite know or understand, but when I take a look back, I see where that trajectory is leading, and I get a clearer sense of where God might be wanting to call me and ask me to do right now. So I'm going to invite all of you today to do the same exercise, to look back over your lives and to identify people who seem to be uh, signs or help us be, uh, help you be attentive to signs of God's presence, times when you responded, times that might have been turning points in your life. And I invite you to create your own salvation histories to get a clearer sense of where God might be calling you as well. One interesting thing about this, however, is that if we do the same exercise three years from now or five years from now, that timeline and that series of events is likely to look different because as we look back on the basis of new experience, we're likely to see new things. We're likely to, to identify as important encounters with people as signs of God that we hadn't recognized before. So what I hear today in the scriptures is an invitation for us today to be attentive to be attentive to what might be a divine intervention of sorts through people in our lives through that we know well, through normal kinds of interactions that just catch us up a little bit by surprise and invite us into something different. Amen. With all this in mind, I am going to invite you to an exercise, a prayer that we've done before. I mentioned that the scriptures have to do with attuning our senses today. How do, what are the signs that we hear? What are the signs that we see? So it seemed appropriate as a prayer to revisit a, a, a ritual that is, happens during the period of the, just before the period of the catechumenate called the signing of the senses. Again, uh, you've experienced this before, I think in this very format. Uh, and I invite you, if you so choose, to sign yourself as I read these invocations. Receive the sign of the cross on your forehead. It is Christ himself who now strengthens you with this sign of his love. Learn to know him and follow him. Receive the sign of the cross on your ears, that you may hear the voice of the Lord. Receive the sign of the cross on your eyes, that you may see the glory of God. Receive the sign of the cross on your lips, that you may respond to the word of God. Receive the sign of the cross over your heart, 
that Christ may dwell there by faith. Receive the sign of the cross on your shoulders, that you may bear the gentle yoke of Christ. Receive the sign of the cross on your hands, that Christ may be known in the works that you do. And receive the sign of the cross on your feet, that you may walk in the way of Christ. So I sign all of us with the sign of eternal life in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. It's in the screen.